as, uh, as I've been introduced, yes, I was married by a, a Belgian priest. Um, I actually married a woman, which was a good thing. He was just a minister. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I hope that was clear. Um, <laughs> I'm based in the UK, uh, but as has been said, I've, uh, I've spent the last three and a half years looking after all of our research efforts in uh, southern and eastern Europe. Um, so I think I come with a little bit of perspective from both being a consumer in the UK, being surrounded by e-commerce, and uh, uh, and as we've seen already this morning, you know, the e-commerce market in the UK is uh, is pretty developed. Um, we understand obviously it's significantly less developed here, um, but that's kind of akin with what I see in many southern European countries, Italy and Spain, uh, Turkey, some of our emerging markets as well. Don't necessarily have the uh, the maturity um, that the, the the, uh, the UK uh, market has. Um, touching on a couple of things that Yoris said earlier uh, about reaching your creative agency and your uh, uh, media agency at the same time, we should probably have briefed the printing agency and the speaker, myself, at the same time, because there's a slight disconnect on what I'm going to present today, which is, at its core, obviously, the research uh, that we conducted last year here in Belgium. Uh, but I'm also going to try and weave in a little bit of a, a narrative <coughs> touching on some of the points that some of our other speakers uh, have mentioned uh, this morning. So please forgive me if I don't know all of the numbers and I refer to my notes a couple of times, but uh, uh, rest assured, obviously, all of this data is publicly available. You guys can get hold of it. Um, copies of it will be made available to you all, so don't feel that you have to scribble down uh, every number that comes up. And, and actually, I'm going to spare you lots and lots of charts and graphs. So. Uh, uh, so you know, hopefully you can take the you, know, you can take the story of, of, of what I'm trying to what I'm trying to say. Click her. So I think we've seen already that you know, e-commerce is growing. It's growing in Belgium. It's growing in the UK. It's growing everywhere. And you know, we've seen that you know, in Belgium especially, it's, it's growing very very rapidly. Um, some of my thunder's been stolen already. Uh, these figures we had in our earlier quiz, uh, seeing that. You know, travel two years ago really was the mainstay of, of e-commerce in, uh, in Belgium, whereas today we have a bit more of a balanced pie, um, as you can see, uh, 903 million. Um, but I think interesting for me is, is finance, um, and to some extent tech, where in the UK and in Germany we see that these are, you know, these are really huge, um, huge industries uh, for e-commerce, and you know, finance especially is not quite such a, um, uh, quite such a developed uh, industry here and I think you know some of the things that I'll come on to and some of the findings from the research indicate that you know potentially it could be and I think you know some of the things that we've seen as well today talking about well actually the, the foreign governments coming in capturing uh, uh, capturing business within within the Belgian market well clearly financial services is one of the things that you really need to be you know, in Belgium for it's very difficult for um, you know, foreign banks to come here they, they really do need to set up and establish it's much easier to sell and send a pair of jeans from the UK or from the US to Belgium. It's much, much harder, obviously, to sell somebody a mortgage or an insurance product if they're based in, uh, in Malaysia or you know, London or wherever. So what, what drives consumers um, to buy online? Uh, now, this study that we did was with uh, 1,000 Belgian consumers. Um, it was conducted online, so bear in mind that this isn't the total population. You know, there are, obviously, significant number of people that don't have internet and don't use the internet, but you know, when we asked them, you know, what is it that makes you want to buy online, um, many, many of the sort of functional benefits of, of e-commerce and e-shopping kind of come to the fore. Um, open 24 hours, uh, by far and away, the, the, biggest, um, uh, the biggest reason why people want to shop online. And you know, I think an interesting anecdote that I, that I read in the, uh, in, the, in the newspapers in the UK was that I think actually Christmas Day in the UK is one of the biggest shopping days of the year. Uh, now what that says for the quality of British cuisine on Christmas Day uh, or the quality of presents that people have been given on, on Christmas Day, I don't know. But what's interesting is that people are still continuing to engage in commerce, e-commerce, buying stuff. Uh, even on, on days that you, you wouldn't necessarily expect. Um, clearly, distance is, is a big thing. Uh, it's, it's hugely convenient to both be able to buy something online, um, you know, remotely and have it sent to you. And you know, the one thing that we all know about and hate is obviously standing in a queue at the supermarket, at the shop. Uh, and you know, moreover, going to the shop and finding that the thing that you want doesn't there. It's not in stock. So 
I mean, I think the, the key thing here is that these functional benefits are, are, are really the mainstay of why people want to shop online. And, and you know, that's a great advantage that the internet has over the <coughs> offline world. What is it that, that people don't like about buying online? You know, what is it that makes people scared? Um, why aren't they adopting it? We saw earlier today that perhaps in Belgium that the shelves are a little bit empty. You know, we don't quite have the, uh, the range of products available to buy online. I think Jonathan's little story about buying a mouse catcher uh, was interesting. I wonder whether it's possible to, to buy a mouse catcher uh, in Belgium. I don't know if there's anyone out there who you know, thinks there's a market in buying rodent traps, but you know, I think the diversity of what's available uh, in some of the mature markets um, is really what drives people to buy because uh, you know, finding these products and, and having them available to you, it would take you a long time to go and find a rat catcher in the offline world, whereas online suddenly brings those things together. And so clearly the availability of produce is, is, is one of the main reasons why people aren't, aren't buying online. But to take, take that to one side, it's like, well, what is it you know, beyond obviously availability of, availability of products? You know, we think that you know, e-commerce here in Belgium is likely to grow uh, over, the, over the next years. Um, so taking away that availability issue, um, what is it that, that Belgians say that is, uh, is stopping them from buying online? And remember, these are these are online users. Um, the little pictures we've got here: fifty-one percent of people want to be able to touch, feel, interact with the product. Um, it's not just limited to fashion: sofas, beds, home and garden, TVs. People want to see that. You know, how good is the screen? How good is the picture quality? What does it sound like? Yeah, there are many, many things that clearly you know, the internet cannot deliver. Um, 41% of people really, really value the, uh, the interaction that they have with the people in the shop. Um, clearly, when you're buying produce, you, you need to be able to understand, you know, what's it going to do for you? Is it going to work? Is it going to fit? Um, you know, there's lots of, uh, lots of things that, that need to be considered. And then postage and or, or shipping uh, is, is, is significant. But the one thing that I really want to touch on here is this 31% trust. Um, I think Buying online is a leap of faith. You know, it just didn't happen 10 years ago. Uh, we did have distant shopping, catalogues, etc. But the internet has really opened up the opportunity to buy rodent catchers, to buy, I'm at the moment uh, re redoing my house and I bought my bath, my taps, my tiles, I bought everything online. And I wouldn't have been able to do that 10 years ago. I wouldn't have wanted to have done it 10 years ago. It's only through the fact that I I've bought many, many products online. You know, I have a, I have a long history, I have good experience from buying online. I start to value all these functional benefits that, that I trust buying online. And, and I find it, you know, all of those functional benefits that I've mentioned completely outweigh the, this issue of trust. But clearly for emerging markets, you know, where e-commerce is growing, and as I said, you know, Spain, Italy, where I've done a lot of work over the last couple of years, you see exactly that. People just don't want to buy online because they just don't trust what's going to happen. They're punching their credit card details into the internet, they hit enter, what happens? You know, is, is, the, is the good going to arrive? Um, when they arrive at the airport, will their ticket actually work? You know, so I think this emotional barrier is something that you know, it's going to take time to overcome. But I think you know, there are indeed ways to kind of overcome that. And uh, you know, we've seen a couple of examples today that Jonathan shared with us, and you know, I will share with you both what Belgian consumers are saying, but also perhaps a, a couple of examples from, uh, from a couple of websites who are, who are really trying to work hard to you know, remove this, this emotional barrier of trust and give as, as, much, uh, as much encouragement to, uh, to consumers. So when we ask our sample, well, what do they actually want? It kind of mirrors what we've just seen, you know? So, you know, free shipping costs. And I think a lot's been spoken about shipping today. Um, I have no idea about how to ship products in, in, in Belgium and then nothing about the sort of fulfillment, distribution, <coughs> postage costs, whatever, but it's a commonly, commonly cited pain point for consumers that they see a product, it's perfectly priced, they sign up, they do all of the, the stuff that they need to do, they get the shipping and then suddenly the cost of the, uh, cost of the product doubles because you know, they have to get it from A to B. So I think making sure that you know, shipping costs are very clearly labelled, understood and you know, if possible, actually factored into the purchase price of the product, I think we'll see a lot of, uh, 
uh, and you'll see a lot of, of good movement and growth coming from just the availability of being able to get your product um, to, to the consumer. Um, the only other thing I want to sort of mention here is obviously we have a little picture of the Belgian flag, and I think that's the big, big opportunity for, for you guys in the room here is that you, know, you are Belgian businesses, you know, selling to Belgian consumers and, and then the world. Um, but Belgian consumers want someone to talk to. They want a, a, a physical address in Belgium. Um, and I think to my point around trust and you know, not trusting uh, websites or e-commerce, having the ability to talk to someone, knowing that it's a .be address, knowing that there's a physical store or someone to talk to, you know, who speaks your language and understands your concerns and your pains, is, uh, is something that uh, is, um, is key. And uh, I think the other thing here, the little picture at the top, uh, perhaps indicates that uh, although it comes down a little bit further down the list, I think the after sales service and the returns options is huge. You know, um, clearly you get the product, you get your new pair of shoes and you don't like them, or well, what do you do? You know, it's an awful hassle to have to send them back. And making sure that that's absolutely clear, I think, is a, uh, is a, is a key thing. So, going back to, to ASOS, which we saw this morning, um, Jonathan pointed out, I mean, it's, this is just a, a page that I just, that they just picked up, and I think interesting here is, you know, it's, it's very obvious that we've got free delivery, um, and free delivery worldwide is obviously a limited offer that, uh, that, that was happening at the time, but you know, these guys are shipping everywhere, it's very clear that the price you're paying is, uh, how much is this jacket? I'm not sure it's my, to my taste. It's 180 pounds, quite a lot for a yellow, uh, yellow eye rack. I probably wouldn't buy this, but at least I know it's going to cost me 280 pounds, and it's not now going to cost me 310 pounds because I have to have delivery on. Um, some other nice touches here is obviously the, you know, the related related items and you know, complete the look. So I think you have to remember that you know online is a great opportunity. Um, offline is a great opportunity as well. When someone's in your, in your store, you have the ability to to send them to the left, to the right, you know, the signage, the, the, the way you lay your store out is hugely important. So clearly the way you lay out your site is, is really no different, making sure that actually other products are available uh, that might complement the one that's of particular interest. Looking at uh, booking.com, um, it's I think actually one of Google's uh, globally largest clients and clearly they're, they're offering a very, very different uh, uh, sales proposition. You know, uh, hotels, flights, uh, etc. Again, you know, this has really just got to be functional. You know, clearly we've got a trust issue. You know, people don't necessarily want to buy or book things online, but we've, to really capitalise and, and to really try and you know grow this kind of, uh, of trust, it's, it's about making sure that the products that are available are easily discoverable as well. And so, you know, the, the range of options you know that you can sort your hotels by. Uh, by price, by ratings, um, uh, by reviews, and you can see there's lots of stars there. You know, this Florist Hotel, uh, uh, Island Grand Grand Palais, uh, doesn't rate as highly as obviously the uh, the Metropole. I wouldn't know. Uh, we stayed in a very nice guest house last night, um, which I'm not sure is on booking. But uh, um, the availability of reviews and uh, and, and clearly all of the, the the ways to filter um, the uh, the different options, I think again are something that can. You know, help to bridge that, that trust or that emotional barrier to, to buy online. So, think, thinking about your e commerce, um, Julian talked a little bit this morning about saying e commerce is kind of dead, it's actually about, it's about commerce, it's about you know, how online and offline work together. And you know, something that I hear a lot of the time um, when I'm out talking to clients, you know, both, both retailers but also uh, you know, other businesses um, is like well, but you know, online is not really relevant for me. You know, it's not relevant for my business, and I always counter that. I think you know, online is always relevant for your business. I think we've got a great example today um, uh, coming after me of you know of, of, of a Belgian company selling donkey milk. You know, now not in my wildest dreams or thoughts would I would I thought that, that donkey milk would have a place in, in online, but I think as we'll see as we'll see later, you know. Even you know, very, very traditional offline businesses, you know, the online presence is, is key. And um, not from the study that we did, but from uh, from another study that we we've run actually across the globe now. I think we have it live in 35 countries uh, or 36 countries. Is 
Um, the Consumer Commerce Barometer, I, I'd urge you to have a look. There's loads of great data in there, Belgium's obviously included, but one of the stats that I pulled out um, from, uh, uh, from this study, and it's actually an online tool, you can, um, you can uh, choose exactly what products you're interested in, uh, the, the types of metrics that, uh, that you're interested in seeing those products benchmarked against. And I've just pulled out a, a couple here, which is, you know, I've changed my mind about which brand to buy following research on the web. Uh, 34% in Belgium, and the internet is usually the first place I go um, when researching products to buy. 36%. So you know this is significant, very very significant. So you know online is important, even if you have no plans to ever sell online, um, or you know perhaps structurally it's not possible to sell online. You know the types of business you're in means that, that you can't sell online, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't matter. And I think this is you know this is stark evidence that it does matter. And Looking at uh, the UK and kind of following on from uh, from Olivia and Jonathan's talk this morning about the gap is well, you know, it's even more important in the UK. Well, why is it more important in the UK? Well, because the e-commerce market is bigger, and I think as the e-commerce market grows in Belgium, that 34, that 36 percent, I think is likely to grow as well. And I think you know, as people are buying more and more things online, they're going to start putting more trust in online, and therefore trust in uh, in in, in the internet and the things that they find on the internet. So this, this slide here is, is really kind of confirms um, you know, what we've just seen, but this is actually from a study that, that we ran last year. And you know, interestingly, you know, results from search engine, and I'm not a salesperson, I promise, um, <laughs> came out as top, but I think you know, it kind of makes sense because you know when somebody Recommend a product to you, or said, "Hey, you know, uh, Joris was talking about some trainers earlier. You know, check out these trainers or anything like that." Probably the first thing you do is, is just going to search for it online is to actually validate that recommendation. Um, so, again, you know, even from the offline world and, and, and direct mail, offline media, Joris uh, talked about integrated planning. Clearly, you know, the messages that we send to consumers offline are very, very often validated online. So, you know. Online, I think, you know, that really is, you know, really, really important. I think as has been intonated as well, it's just one piece. You know, e-commerce, perhaps not dead, but, you know, we should be looking about commerce. And, and you know, we've, we've clearly seen evidence that, that online and offline work together. It's about integrating your channels and making sure that there's a holistic consumer experience for, uh, for people online and offline. And... <coughs> We've got numbers, we've got research, and you, you probably don't even need the numbers or the data, but you know, that, that groundswell of interest that's built up online does have an impact in the offline world. And you know, this is actually a stat from the States where we see that 87% of purchases uh, completed after a search were made offline. So you know, if you do just think about online only, you're also missing a large piece of the pie as well, because you know, offline traditional, it's not going to go away. Um, but what you do online does influence what you do offline. Um, we can measure that as well. Uh, it's not always easy. Um, as Yoris pointed out, you know, attribution of, uh, of advertising spend or of marketing to, uh, to, offline, uh, to offline sales or to, to any result is, is difficult, but it can be measured. This is an example from, uh, from Spain, uh, a piece of work that I did there last year. So this is looking at the offline sales volume for PC City, which is a, a big computer uh, store in Spain. And here you can see a kind of decomposition of their sales, so understanding what channels are driving sales in their physical store. So you can see that you know, their price key has an impact on how many units of computers they sell, uh, price promotion special offers, TV advertising 5%, uh, catalogs, which is their main sort of marketing channel that they use and pour a huge amount of marketing money into driving 15% of their total offline business press, 3%, um, radio, out of home. You know, these investments are making demonstrable differences to their, to their sales volumes, but in yellow, 11% of their offline business is driven by their website. So if, if, if ever there's evidence that online is driving offline, you, know, you can see it here. Um, and clearly the experience that you have on the web the experience that you give your customers on the web, whether they choose to buy online or not, is likely to have a very significant impact on uh, what you're doing um, 
in terms of revenue offline in your stores. This is another, another example, a um, little bit closer to Belgium, this is from Germany, this is people buying DSL contracts with, uh, uh, with Vodafone and again we can see the mix of, of research and where the research is done and where the purchase actually happens. So again, you know, it, it's, just, it's just critical to remember that, you know, that, that what happening, what's happening in the online world translates not just to the online world but also offline as well. <coughs> Excuse me. So, so what does the future look like? You know, what does Belgium need to do? And um, you know, what advice can I give? Well, as a researcher and not an e-commerce merchant, you know, I would never want to try and tell you guys, you know, how to how to structure your business or or, or, or anything like that. But I think, you know, just purely observationally, well, what does the future hold? Well, we know that growth is is likely to occur. We know that Belgian consumers actually want to buy online. There's just not necessarily available through the products, but you know, is that just the future? Um, well, I don't think so. I mean, we now see that half of new internet connections um, around the world are, are coming from mobile devices, and these numbers are, are a little bit old. I think that's from 2009, if my memory serves me correctly, which means that these numbers are already wrong. Um, you know, but they're big, very, very big numbers. 18 million mobile internet users per week in the US. Um, there's 10 million mobile internet users uh, uh, in Indonesia. That's five times more than, uh, uh, than, than is the foreground penetration. And whilst Indonesia might necessarily be your next target market after Belgium, you know, even in Europe, you know, 71 million mobile internet users are coming on or coming online per week. And as I said, these are, these are slightly old numbers. So I think you know, actually today they're, they're likely to be even bigger. Well, just because people are using the mobile internet, does that mean only for you for e-commerce? Well, again, I don't know, but for eBay, yes. In 2010, their mobile sales tripled from 600 million to nearly 2 billion. That's 2 billion a year in sales from a mobile phone, which to me kind of just blows my mind that people you know, are buying from, from their mobile phone. And this is from their mobile phone, not from their iPad. So, you know, even before we get into like the whole you know, tablet revolution that seems to be unfolding in front of us now, this is just phones alone. So, you know, as uh, as the internet becomes more prevalent um, and across a number of different devices, that whole idea of tying up or something online or something offline, and, you know, the consumer experience you give uh, across these platforms is you know, is hugely. Um, you know, many of the mobile operators have already made uh, made big strides here. Uh, my boss Eric Schmidt not my direct boss, but the boss of Google has already made notions that you know, Google are you know, thinking about understanding how mobile phones and, and payment, payment, uh, payment structures can work together. So yeah, the future's now. Um, and and I, I think just the one thing that I want to close on is you know, there's just huge, huge opportunity. And uh, uh, one of the things that you know, I think scares a lot of people, traditional traditional uh, retailers is like, well, how do I move into e-commerce? And if I move into e-commerce, it's going to cannibalize what I'm doing offline in store. And, and I think, you know, the belief um, is that, you know, e-commerce really does represent growth. M-commerce really represents growth. You know, eBay doing nearly, uh, nearly 2 billion uh, a year via mobile phones. That's incremental to what they were doing the year before. It's not that eBay's revenues are flat and they've just gone up, you know, they're, they're, they're growing all the time, but you know, there's an additional two, two billion coming on top. So, I think that's kind of where I want to close. I think e-commerce for Belgium uh, really does actually represent organic growth. There's huge opportunity. The shelves are not as stacked as they could or should be, um, but you know, let's hope that that's set for change and that uh, you know all of you guys can um, can profit from that, that that growing trend. Thank you. Thank you. So, any, there's a little room for questions. You want to that go deeper into the numbers? Or more of hands experience? Okay. Hello? Okay. Um, yeah, it's so, so Henry, thank you for a nice presentation. I'm Henry Sellers from uh, Consento Classifieds. Uh, I was very happy to see that we have so many potential still in Belgium for e commerce. That's good news. Um, but I was wondering, are the differences in the barriers in the United Kingdom 
and the barriers in Belgium. Because if you want to grow, we have to put away it and barriers. Mm -hmm. Yes, fast as possible. So I'm glad you asked that question because it's uh, it's something that actually I made a mental note of to, to, to talk through in the presentation, but uh, clearly my mental note wasn't uh, <laughs> wasn't strong enough. Um, yes, there are um, trust is an issue. Uh, trust is an issue everywhere. I think it's, it's probably the single biggest barrier to, to e-commerce adoption in uh, in any market uh, that I've seen uh, where I've done where I've done research. So. It's there, it exists in the UK market, it exists in all of the other markets that I've looked at, but the extent to which it's a barrier is much bigger here. And I think that's all to do with trial. You know, when you buy online for the first time, uh, when you engage in e-commerce for the first time, it is a little bit daunting. You just don't quite know, you know what's going to happen. You know, is your credit card going to be ripped off and you know, you're going to suddenly get a huge bill? Is the product actually going to arrive? Is it going to be as described? Um, I think familiarity you know, with e-commerce and the e-commerce habit um, is something that you know, British consumers have completely got on with, you know, to the point that Jonathan's buying roving catchers online. Uh, he doesn't need to go and you know, understand the mechanisms by, by going to the store. You know, there's clearly a, a certain level of trust that, that he has. Uh, and so, you know, the, the, the very succinct answer to your question is, yes, they're different, but you know, most, of, most of the functional benefits and most of the emotional barriers that I talked about are prevalent in every market, but just to varying degrees. Okay, thank you. Any other remarks? Yeah, um, I have a question. I'm, I'm uh, a bit wondering where I was a bit um, surprised that there was you know, no mention about uh, social and social commerce as a big uh, area of growth. How do you see that, and, and what will Google do as efforts to promote that? So I, I think you are a touched on a little bit. You know the whole, the whole. Uh, the whole concept of you know passing on messages and you know we look at this you know at Google from a kind of you know how do you control your paid for media, your owned media and your earned media and, and clearly the hardest bit is understanding the, the earned media side, you know, what's the value of someone saying, I recommend this product to you. Um, I think clearly social has a you know, has, has a great part to play in uh, in e-commerce um, and specifically in info commerce as well, you know. Clearly, people have recommended shops and offline businesses, you know, throughout the years, throughout the ages. Um, you know, brands have you know lived and died on you know word of mouth, and you know, as a marketing channel, that's uh, you know that's the one that everyone wants to tap into. So I don't see that there's any particular difference why social offline, social online should really be any different. It is going to play a huge part. Um, you know, what's Google doing about that? Uh, I don't. I'd love to say I have a great answer. It's not because I don't want to, to share it with you. It's just that I don't, you know, I'm not that close enough to specifically our products and our product strategy to say, you know, what is, uh, you know, what is likely to come down the pipeline from Google in terms of products. Um, but I think you know, it's, it's it's definitely known um, throughout the company, and you know, anyone who works in the industry knows that that social and word of mouth is a very very potent um, marketing channel if you can tap into it, whether it be online or offline. Okay, I, 